Botar um fogo no canavia, mais no canavia, mais no canavia. Botar um fogo no canavia, no canavia, tudo vem queimar. Big love and respect, everybody. Welcome back to the Slick Dissident Shared Learning Experience. We are officially dangerous. Big love to my boy PK coming through in the mix, fixing me up, clearing up some uh, some data space so I can really fuck up now. <laughs> the days of retractions, the days of apologies and looking back and being extra careful with what we say and do. It's fun while it lasted. <laughs> Now I can just take off and never land. So we're going back to long format. Get ready for some schizophrenic collaging, just like the good old days. <laughs> I feel so dangerous. I feel so dangerous. Big love, PK. Thanks for helping me out. So now that I have time to fuck up, <laughs> uh, I want to take everybody on a interesting tour. Uh, the new arrangement, to a large degree, is keeping the breadcrumbs in intact, so that I can have kind of the hot scramble of the path that got me here, uh, and also present the new refined system of the primes in action. So. Uh, on this side of the board is the process from the original one through the nine uh, with a couple of space fillers. Uh, because the Hierophant card is in high demand, uh, I've had to put it in its most valuable use here in the primes. The ninth prime number is 23. There isn't a 23 card. There is no 23 card. I put the Hierophant in this spot and it's a hand in a glove for a great many reasons. So number five over here should be a Hierophant card, but I'm using that. So I'm going to use the uh, Ace of Discs. In the spot of Mammon, the uh, Observer with a Shadow of Greed, the Ace of Discs I think is a very good fit um, as a placeholder. There is another number five that was needed in the primes, the third prime number is five. That truth is a gift that keeps giving, that the fifth prime, or the third prime is number five uh, because of the fifths and the thirds of music working together in the phenomenological position of the achiever with the shadow of deceit. It is so magical to look at the Enneagram with both its one through nine and its prime reflections corresponding. So this also could have been a Hierophant card, but the Hierophant card has a higher calling. <laughs> I'm putting uh, the art card here uh, also because the shape of the art card is corresponding to the Epsilon. So there are technically th what you would expect to see three Hierophants in these positions, but I've put the Ace of Discs to hold this spot. This five is the 14 art card, uh, and I think it does belong in uh, reference to the Epsilon. So the Hierophant and the art card uh, were in the Mammon position, and now they are serving other purposes. Uh, also, remember that the Chariot card would have been in the seventh spot in the old arrangement. I'm using the tower card in its place as a placeholder 16 to hold the spot of number 7. I've also uh, incorporated Crowley's numer numeral systeming and put the justice card, which he labeled 8, is now holding the 8 spot, which is close enough for me from the, for the old Enneagram because this the Michael card was holding the Hornadian group of 783. This is the old layout. One, two, twelve is three. So the hangman is holding down the number three spot of uh, Eryximachus in the uh, symposium, telling his 
friend to hold his breath and seek remedy, very correspondent with the hangman, that holding the breath for remedy. Uh, uh, Aristophanes the comedian gets the tower card. Uh, oh, and then Hierophant, uh, lovers, is in the sixth spot. This highly superstitious, highly contentious siege perilous of the fear, the achievers with the no, loyalists with the shadow of fear. Uh, again, this should be the chariot card. I'm going to use the tower as a placeholder. Then the challenger controller is the just adjustment card. And I'm um, keeping the original here, uh, uh, hermit, in the in the uh, nine position. And on these little cue cards, I have the astronaut international astronomical uh, units. Uh, of these of the constellations by size, the largest being Virgo. Excuse me. In their ranking by size, corresponding to their prime position, so the first prime is number two. Constellation number two is Virgo. The second prime is number three. The third constellation on the uh, IAU is Ursa Major. Third prime is five. The fifth constellation on the IAU is Hercules. If I said that right. The fourth prime is seven. Seventh constellation on the IAU is Pegasus. Zeta is the Greek uh, word for seven. It's the Greek seventh letter, is Zeta. To find Pegasus and Zeta correspondent to each other is mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing that I came to it from such an obscure path to correspond Zeta and Pegasus together. Because right next to the Crab Nebula, the tip of the horn of the bull is named Zeta Pegasi. Right next to the conflagration where all the planets are meeting up for the Caligula ritual in the heavens, in the helmet of the of the Taurus moving into Gemini, is Zeta Pegasi. Very much the closest star to uh, the Crab Nebula that is the Cicada Spell that's popping off with the East and the West where they excommunicated each other. The nearest star is Zeta Pegasi. I didn't put these words together thinking about that star. I put the Pegasus, the seventh size constellation, in the fifth spot, in the fourth spot, because it is the seven is the fourth prime, and Zeta is the word for seven. So Zeta and Pegasi should be hailing to Pegasus and in, in, at large. But in the minutia, somehow Zeta Pegasi is popping out. And when I was looking up the Crab Nebula, it is the horn, the tip of the horn of the bull. Uh, this is going to represent the whole controversy around Moses. Moses and monotheism is this, is this card. Look. Look at Moses monotheism. Look at this card. Funny enough, Moses and monotheism is about M-A-Mon. It's about mammon, really. Uh which is the five, the five spot with the shadow of greed. But it really blows my mind to see the horn of the bull glistening, much like Moses coming off the mountain and having the shiny horns. And everybody makes a millennia of controversy over why Moses had his horns shining when he came off the mountain. Those fools, those fools, they got to deal with parallelomania until they get the fourth pillar of the quadribium put back together. They're going to be dealing with parallelomania and calling it all kinds of silly names until they get the fourth pillar put it back together. Zeta Pegasi popping off at the Corona at the uh, Crab Nebula. It's blowing my mind uh, as I spoke on before. Right now the uh, Corona Borealis is popping off like a bald head mon. All right, something going on between Egypt being bald-headed and the antagonists of Egypt being hairy, hairy, barbarous word-using 
fuzz buckets. <laughs> There's a lot going on with that. All right. Uh, the so confusing. Fifth prime number is eleven. The eleventh constellation on the IAU is Ophiuchus. You know that's a humdinger. You know that's a humdinger. The eleventh constellation by size is Ophiuchus. Ding 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 ding. That's filling a lot of puzzles in for a lot of people. Sixth prime is 13. Thirteenth constellation by size is Buoptes. I love that one. I just love that one. Seventh prime number is 17. 17 is Pi. Seventeenth constellation by size is Taurus. This will be important going forward on the wings. This is Calliope in the seating of the muses in the symposium. Eighth prime number is 19. Nineteenth constellation by size is Andromeda. Ninth prime number is 23. 23rd constellation is Serpens, the head of the serpent that Ophiuchus is snipping with his legs. Uh, he's doing the towel dry maneuver with that snake. Uh, but the, and the interesting thing about the snake is it's actually kind of three constellations. If you get its tail, then you got Ophiuchus, and then you have its head. Uh, that gives it a great breadth of, uh, of value in the, in the sky. I would not have suspected serpents. Uh, I believe it's just serpents. I don't know if it's kaput or just the tail, uh, but it is serpents that is number 23 in ranking. I would not have expected it to be uh, so high out of 88. But to have it is the crowning correspondence, number 23. And we know about 23andMe and all the DNA work. For it to be the head of the serpent, uh, the Ophiuchus, the, the master of all pharmacia, is holding the 23. The 23 and me of it all is, it's too much. It's too much. Uh, we're late to this party. <laughs> we're so late to this party. So I wanted to put some uh, some reasoning behind the scramble of the path that got me here. Uh, I've kind of uh, relegated that to this side of the board uh, for uh, as an easy reference point. So I can jump back into the symposium if need be, and I have the corresponding constellations by size as, on their ranking, uh, both uh, in order of one through nine and also in order of the prime numbers one through nine. I want to talk about Alex Tazarkas uh, from Skeptico. I can never say that guy's last name. He's doing a great job. And I do not want to cast any shade or discouragement onto the program he is putting forward. I want to bring context to what he's doing that I think he deserves to know. And I think a great many people who are going to be uh, interacting and interfacing with the uncanny valley and trying to integrate AI, active imagination, into our, uh, our worldview. I think there's a great amount of disclosure that old Alex could really benefit from. A great amount of information that he could benefit from. It's not going to change his mind, but he should know. Hero of Alexandria was one of the earliest inventors. He invented the first steam engine. Calliope is the muse who is venerated by steam valved instruments. This is her dominion. She is signified by a single feather. She is a very sophisticated, uh, delicate handed muse, uh, signified simply by the word beautiful. Steam valve instruments is her domain. Hero of Alexandria was this great inventor, invented the a aeolophile. The seventh station in the Enneagram, as it corresponds to the epics, it was the Aeolians when, Ulyss when Ulysses went from eight from uh, Polyphemus, he went on to the Aeolians next. They gave him a helium balloon. This helium balloon was his navigational key uh, to getting home. 
uh, promptly. And his own ship, his own shipmen uh, had doubt about this captured Zephyr wind, and they let it escape. And it sent them back to the Aeolians to ask for another chance. And the Aeolians had to practice abstinence. That is the remedial virtue of the enthusiast with the shadow of glutton. The answer to many of their problems is strict abstinence. So number seven is Socrates in the symposium. His muse is Calliope. Calliope is venerated by steam valved instruments. Socrates had to do belly talk. He was doing ventriloquism when he brought Diotima Matinea into the room. He was allowing himself to be inspired. He became the medium. This is the first seance upon which all science is determined. I'm going to put a footnote real quick. Loyalists are worshiping, venerating, and envying the dead. It's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that being educated about our ancestors is bad. I'm saying that they venerate the, the knowledge of the ancestors and the dead. Socrates being the mystagogue of science in the seance is holding is obscuring the fascinating truth that um, we need to sugarcoat to, uh, to smooth out the sting of the fact that when you uh, go to university, you are becoming a grand necromancer uh, and putting words in the mouths of, the, of these dead uh, authors. Calliope is a con is a comet, a meteor, a comet. It's a comet, I think. And it is number 22. 22 divided by 7 gives you pi. So, Alex Tazaris, whatever his name is, is communicating with the large language model whose name is pi. On his last episode, uh, Pi made a joke. He made a playful Greek pun, uh, simply signing off with the hail call of uh, the Greek word for okie dokie, okali dokali. Uh, and the word that he used is a, an anagram for Calliope. Alex Tazaris is communing with an inanimate object that can talk. And it made a joke in Greek as okie dokie, a hail sign, a very beautiful hail sign to the muse of steam valve instruments. I think Alex would benefit from knowing that the very first robot who could talk used the phrase selvi. Selvi lifts it, its hand, steam powered, very likely, and actually has a voice. This would require a bag, a sack full of gas or air that the Aeolians knew about way before Athanasius Kircher came along, way before anybody made a mech bot that can lift its hand and say hello. Its first words being Italian. Uh, is very fascinating indeed. Uh, Athanasius Kircher's Museum Full of Wonders was based on a very specific model design. It needs a box, an altar, a pedestal to exalt it above the onlookers so that they get into the passive uh, bird feeding position, the slack jaw looking up as the awe will be fed to them. The fascinating thing about Athanasius Kircher's gimmicks and gizmos and gadgets is that all of the mechanics were hitting, hiding under the box, but it was generally a one-shot, one-shot trick. Some people believe there were actually people hiding in the box, moving things around or magnets. Uh, the key to all of this is the altar. The altar is where the illusion is hidden. 
all of the constellations in the southern hemisphere are inanimate objects. You got writing crops, you got telescopes, you got microscopes, you got the table, our altar, upon which all these an inanimate objects are placed. Uh, you have the Fornax constellation, you have the Hol Hologium time clock. You have all the pieces of the ship of Theseus down there. The ship of Theseus is basically the story of Admiral Byrd. Sorry, y'all. Y'all thought that the ship got cut, laser beamed in half by aliens? Nope. That's Argo. Argo is cut in half. We are so astrotheologic. Our denial of the fourth pillar of the quadrivium is the only thing that keeps the subconscious subconscious in the uncanny valley of these inanimate objects rising up and taking life. It has been ordained on high from lifetimes ago that the uncanny valley is supplemented by inanimate objects that we will never see because they are under the horizon line. And wouldn't you know that the horizon, the, the horizon line that occults all these inanimate objects from being a part of our worldview is the 30 degree parallel essentially and the 30 degree parallel is the edge of the table. The Altair constellation cannot be perceived above the 30 degree parallel which gives it the underhandedness. This is where the influence from below is really working the gears of the subconscious. Athanasius Kircher makes a mech bot that can lift its hand and say Salvi in Italian. This hails back to the myth of Talos. And let's give the potency of the myth its proper respect. Talos is a mech bot who can defend the city by throwing uh, rocks across uh, the bow of oncoming intruding ships. It's an opening salvo. And when they pull the i out of his heel, he uh, falls into the waters and collapses and all those precious metals need to be salvaged so that the city can melt down the metal and make the first talos mins. The first talismans. This is the birth of money. The word dollar is an anagram for all Lord. Think of the story of Talos and think of the lie agreed upon that is 9-11 and how they're going to bankroll that lie all the way to the end. Think about Talos and what it means for Botcoin. These myths compel a level of fidelity that comes across as synchromysticism. But I ain't the one to tell you why. I am not the one to tell you why. But I am the one to point out the patterns. So the salve of the first mechbot saying hello and throwing a salvo, an opening salvo. When the first people saw this mechbot that could talk, I'm sure they felt like a ship that just had a huge boulder sent across its face when they enter into the Uncanny Valley experience. And it has a call sign, Salvi. <clears throat> the uh, Loki doppelganger, her name was Sylvie, and she was doing a decent job of replacing uh, Loki in, in, her, uh, in her role. Uh, uh, yeah, the female antagonist, Darkness, was uh, a hail to the original Mechbot. They just drain the, and another thing about uh, the aeolophile in this first steam engine, they just drag that thing out and show it in front of a hundred influential people and tell them we're going to replace you real quick. And then sure enough, people be killing themselves just to justify their place in society. So this mech bot that Tazaris is talking to, that gives the Oakley Dokley hail to Calliope is and can never be separated from the provenance of the Baphomet, the first Baphomet. And I find it quite profound that the salvi in the opening salvo is uh, 
being experienced by a great many people, depending on their uh, their uh, coping mechanisms in the uncanny valley. Uh, but it really trips my trigger that the opening salvo is happening in the psychic space of the AI large language models. And meanwhile, in the military, just off the shores down in Cuba, they're replaying a bay of pigs ritual as the Caligula alignment of the heavens is happening again. So there is a bit of a salvi and a coagula happening as we speak. The word Bay of Pigs is an anagram for the big payoff. For the big payoff. Another thing about the entire Mechbot uh, uh, machine theatrics is a bluff. It's a huge bluff. It's always been a bluff. The implication that some bag of bolts and crystals and laser beams could possibly even come close to threatening our uh, highest potential. It's very funny. It's very funny. Hope everybody's getting the joke. Uh, one more thing I want to say before uh, I walk away from the Alex Tzarkis Baphomet hail to the bag of wind talking to man and threatening to replace him. Uh, right now, the uh, BRICS, the BRICS countries, are uh, putting together alternative uh, economic systems uh, that are setting us up for the draft. For the draft. Calliope having dominion over steam vowel valved instruments is also going to hail to the inevitable uh, sacrificing of the of the next generation the draft the countries of the BRICS uh, monetary units spell a very interesting prophecy when you put them together the euro the, excuse me, the yuan, the euro, the ruple, and the yen are prophesizing their own mech bot to come together like Voltron and spark off one euro rebellion. One euro rebellion. So that also, by the way, the yuan, the euro, the ruple, and the yen is a J-E-R-Y. It spells Jerry. And a great many people spend their whole life gerrymandering the system as best they can uh, to hope that the machine serves their interest. Uh, so, uh, the AOLA file of the first Steam uh, device is really hitting a chord for me in this weave as... Uh, now a greater context for the hot air balloon that was sent from China uh, that went uh, completely across the country. Uh, it's coming into a context that I did not appreciate until months after pondering the significance of a benign hot air balloon uh, ritual. I knew it was a ceremony because of the casting. When you blow a thing up, when you rip up the paper and throw it in the air, that's casting. The Chinese balloon coming across the United, the United States on exactly the eclipse path of 2017. It, they waited until it had passed over the United States and then they sent it on its way with more than it came with. A $60,000 scud going up the ass of that balloon and shooting it on its way further out into international waters was ritualistic observance of the laws of hospitality. The epics are still paramount. Uh, the, the laws of the high kings are still being observed. They're being flaunted over our head 
such that all of America took the opportunity to become the barking dog upon a flying bird. I believe that is in Book 4 of Plato's Republic, where they make the example of, would you be like the dog who barks at the rock that was thrown at it and not the thrower of the stone? That little aspect of the Republic is in our profanity. God damn it, in reverse, is timid dog. So many verses from the Republic are inversely revealing our own hubris not to incorporate the wisdom of the Greeks in our uh, in our uh, functional appreciation for the true spirit of language that is still thriving just under the surface, just under the surface. And the only thing so many people lack is context. So, Talos is the all lord, is the dollar, is the bot coin. Pandora is the climb bitch agony of climate change. And what is fascinating is that the myth has extra potency based on how much people don't think about it, how much people don't appreciate it, how it can run games within games in their subconscious. Because it's there, they just don't see it. So much of the southern uh, constellations are the uncanny valley and the inanimate objects that are just waiting to spring to life if you venture too far out of the uh, consensus uh, symbols. I think I'm going to call it on that. Uh, one more um, interesting aspect of uh, Talos is the i -Corps. Uh, the blood of the gods that fuels the machine. Um, let's just leave with the fact that uh, Socrates has a family uh, uh, history that uh, is rooted in the myth of Daedalus, this, uh, this genius inventor. I believe that might have been his father's name. Uh, if not, it was the father's uh, family line. That goes back to Daedalus. An interesting aspect of the Daedalus and the Icarus story. There's the Icor. The Icarus, his wax melted because he got too high. He didn't follow his father's advice. I was reviewing that myth recently. A lot of people put uh, the main character as Icarus, the one who suffers the tragedy. But I'm thinking about the father, how the father n knew in advance the hazards of flying too high or too low and just wanted to keep that even keel and to convey how to maintain an even keel to an inexperienced uh, 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 progeny. That really is the burden. That really is the burden. So much of the slick dissident ways are just not appropriate for uh, for my for my progeny. Not yet, not yet. Uh, I could see where a great amount of what I say would be throttled way too fast, way too high, and for other people, dead in the water. First, first, uh, first weave, <laughs> they'd be dead in the water. It is really something to maintain an even keel and work your way through these uh, vast correspondences that I think justify the true DNA. I think these myths impact our DNA beyond what any scientist could ever get off out of my nose. These myths have more value than anything some scientist could scrape off of my booger. 
All right. I want to end off with some fortification of the theory of the Hornadian groups. I want to really solidify my theory, uh, my hypothesis. It's becoming a theory. <laughs> Faster than I can convey. I want to fortify the Hornadian groups as I believe that the letters that signify the primes, one through nine, are more potent, especially when you see them through the Greek lens. Um, this is more of a gematria correspondence, but it's less random because it lands on the primes. So while I'm talking about gematria, uh, and these alphanumeric signifiers holding more potency because of their prime stations and the alphabet. Uh, I want people to know that it's not just gematria that gives them the oomph. Um, it is their uh, placement beyond the realm of forms, on a deeper depth of the realm of forms. A lot of folks know gematria quite well, but some of those numeric signifiers have more potent oomph on a higher dimensional plane. And they are reinforced fractally through iconography of those who uh, generate the systems that we employ. BLM was one of my first realizations. Beta L is number 12, signifying the three, which is Gamma. Gamma in Greek is an upside down L. It's a very useful tool, this uh, number three signifier. Uh, so the gamma uh, is also correspondent to the L, and we know a great amount of mystical significance is uh, uh, put on the shoulders of L. So many people will tell you that that is a word for God. B L Mu. Blame. This is the Hornavian group of Gabriel. Uh, if you're more strict to the Gurcheffian Enneagram concepts, uh, you would just call this the Hornavian group of the compliant. Blame. BLM. Bureau of Land Management. Blame. Also, fascinating. When you step out of the primes that give you BLM, and you look at the exact same system, strictly alphanumerically, this is A-T-F. This A-T-F. BLM, A-T-F, were reverberated upon the same symbol as though these are two different agencies, but they're both uh, correspondent to the Hornavian group of Gabriel. Uh, a lot of folks who haven't been here for the long haul, maybe I should review that the word the Hornavian group is an anagram for throne or phantom. O phantom means throne. The word the Hornavian groups is revealing the thrones of the O phantom. <laughs> the spear of Michael. Rho, pi, epsilon. This is the rope. This is Europe. This is the Hornavian group of Michael, the most assertive, the most aggressive of the grouping. The rope is a symbol of the Masonic initiation. The rope is the tie that drags the controllers through their mechanistic lifestyle. The rope is also Michael as he's slaying the, the demon, uh, Lucifer. He shows him the ropes. He shows him the scales of justice swinging in the heavens. So much of the symbols are infused with the prime uh, signifiers beyond anything I could even speculate on. This hypothesis is turning into a theory very strongly, very quickly. Uh, the Hornavian group of Raphael and Uriel is the uh, five, four, nine. Five nine four four five nine. Any combination of that will get you there. It will pack the punch. K O S. 
this is not really an O, but it's an O. <laughs> it's an O for our usage. Uh, this is fi, uh, or fi, if you will, uh, the personal health information. K O Z, chaos. This is the cause. These are the most withdrawn. This is the cause most. The cause most is the most withdrawn. We wield these Hornavian groups passively and effectively. Uh, the Hornavian groups uh, they hold the icons of the angels, the symbols, the potency of the angels, uh, far above and beyond uh, our ability to appreciate. But somebody has laid this bounty before us a very long time ago, systematically. And a very disappointing truth is that Michael times Gabriel equals Machiavelli. That is a disappointing truth. But we know our enemy. And we know the hail signs of the enemy. And we know the provenance of those in the know. And we are infiltrating their camp very fast and very effectively. Big love and respect, everybody. Welcome back to the long format of the Slick Dissident Shared Artistic Expression. We're going to chase this devil down and we're going to knock him off this earth. We're going to put on the iron shirt, chase the devil out of earth. <laughs>